want to talk about some of our work on, with autism spectrum disorders. And we've, we started this work before DSM-5 came out. So there's some things that I'll be talking about with Asperger's, which you now know is called high-functioning autism. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of the things that we've done and hopefully talk a little bit about the things that we are going to do. Um, this is an area that's expanding. The, the research in this area is quadrupling every day. And um, the thing you need to be careful about when you, re when you consume the literature is how they're diagnosing the, the people that are in the, um, in the studies, what um, methods they're using with the magnets, because it really makes a difference what you find, and how they um, really looked at the structures. So, so all of these things are really important for a consumer to be a, aware of. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what do we know about social competence? Um, this is something that we talk a lot about, but not a people have, are hard pressed to say what exactly is social competence. And these are this is often found in kids with nonverbal learning disabilities, which we're going to talk about much more today, with autism spectrum disorders, but also with ADHD and with learning disabilities. And what's interesting is some of the things that we've done to work on social competence, we tried with these two groups, and because their differences in their difficulties is so much different than the ones with nonverbal learning disabilities or um, uh, autism, they didn't work as well. Because kids with, aut with ADHD, what is their main problem? Is it that they don't know how to do it? It's that they don't do it, right? And with learning disabilities, very often it's because their processing speed is a little bit slower. So it takes them a little longer. And then we have a lot of comorbidity between learning disabilities and ADHD. So I'm not going to, they only gave me a little bit of time. So I'm not going to talk these, about these two. But I am going to talk about these two and show you what we have found. I think it's really important that we realize that recent estimates indicate about 7 to 10% of the population has problems with this. So this is not an a uh, real rare kind of thing, but does that make every one of these 10% of people autistic? With some people, they think that everyone is. I get a lot of referrals from the schools for a child that has learning problems and or and or social problems, and the question is always, does that child have autism? And I think that, you know, I can't speak for Canada, but in the U.S., to some extent, we're becoming a little less tolerant of differences. And so I'm talking about in broad terms here, but I'm going to get much narrower in just a minute. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? We also know that there's a lot of people out there that are lonely, have a high anxiety, and are very shy. And this is where mental health treatment is really important, and in particularly in the schools. In Minnesota, um, uh, Al Franken, who's one of our senators, has actually uh, passed a bill, or helped pass a bill, to put mental health centers right in the schools instead of the child having to go outside. Maybe you're, I imagine Canada's a little ahead of us, but it's about time. Because a lot of people are having problems. And what are some of these people doing instead of interacting with others? Electronics. You know, I think that's really kind of an issue, you know, of, of not having that face-to-face -to -face or person-to-person -person contact. But I want to talk about what nonverbal learning disabilities. How many of you have heard this term? Okay. How many of you know what the diagnostic criteria are for NVLD? There aren't any. <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> we have some ideas of what is involved, but there's nothing in the DSM. The research differs in how people are classified. So the aspects of NBLD that we have identified and that I've looked in the literature are there's problems in the visual spatial area, there's problems in academia, particularly math, but also in reading comprehension at higher levels, difficulties socially not understanding cues, not understanding nuances, not understanding humor, and there's problems with executive functioning. That's that ability to think on your feet, to be flexible, to think about things from other people's perspective. Okay? So this is how I am defining NVLD. And within this area, these are all subsumed under all of these, all of these regions. So for, executive, for the executive area, which actually has not been studied hardly at all, Byron Rourke is a pioneer. And he basically looked at the visual, spatial, and the academics. 
but the research that's coming now out of California and out of our work is starting to think about these areas as equally as important. And think about executive functioning. Executive functioning is that ability to think on your feet, to change, to have someone else's perspective. And that also is how well we function in the real world. Because you have to be able to think about how things are, are appealing to others in order for you to meet them. We also have to be able to regulate our emotions. If I get really upset, it doesn't work really well when I'm talking to my dean to be really upset. Okay? Working memory, both visual and verbal, that's the ability to keep things in your mind and solve a problem. <coughs> and being able to, oops, bad spelling, being able to be flexible and think about how things can be maybe changed or try something new. If one thing doesn't work, try something new. Kids with nonverbal learning disabilities and children with high functioning autism think of things in one way only. They like their routine, they like it done a certain way, and if you disrupt that, they get really upset. And it's not because they're being willful, and it's not because they're having emotional issues. It's because they really can't be that flexible. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, why that's important. Social. Many times when we see these kids, we'll ask them, do you have friends? And they'll say, yes, I have lots of friends. Everybody in my class is my friend. Can you tell me a couple of their names? And very often they can't, or they'll give you a couple names. Can you tell me what a friend is? That's really the key question right there. <coughs> Not being able to discuss. There's someone that I talk with, or there's someone that I share my feelings with. A lot of these kids have trouble with that. They have problems with reciproca reciprocal conversation, sharing the limelight. Some of you have heard me tell this story. Um, Bismarck, North Dakota is about eight to 10 hour drive to Minneapolis and because the University of Minnesota Medical School catchment area is basically the Dakotas, somewhat Iowa, uh, western Wisconsin and all of Minnesota, very often the people travel a long ways to see us because there's not another major medical s school near them. And so I made the mistake with this one child that came in, very sweet kid, very cute, comes in and, and I made the mistake of saying, well, how was your trip? That'd be something you'd ask, right? He says, do you know there are 596 Holiday Inn signs from here to Bismarck? Do you want to know how many Quality Inn signs there are? How about some Comfort Inn? And, you know, that was his way of engaging me, but totally boring, right? And so it really, it's really hard for them to listen. I also have had kids that have had social skills training, and they will know that they have to share, so they'll say something, then they'll wait for me to say something, but then they'll keep their conversation going on what they first started. It's really not reciprocal, right? Personal space. In Minnesota, we really like our personal space, okay? We really don't like people really tie up close to us. And very often, they're like right on top of you. And so you're like, whoa, get back. Okay? Is it that way in UBC, or are you guys more friendly than we are as far as space? <laughs> I think you're a lot crowded, more crowded than where I'm from. And idioms, that ability to use things. I had a child that was referred to me when I was still a school psychologist, and this was before we even knew really what Asperger's was. And she came to me and she was crying. She says, Miss Peg, Miss Peg, because yes, I let them call me that. Miss Peg, Miss Peg, the, 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 ch the cats and dogs are dying. And if you know me, I love animals. And I go, where? Let me get to them, Katie. And she says, my teacher says it's raining cats and dogs. And they're falling out of the sky. So these idiomatic kinds of things and the humor is really hard for them. They're very literal. So they can get slapstick humor, but they don't get the puns. They don't get the play on words that really pulls you into some of the conversations with other kids. Gross motor, fine motor, visual perception, visual motor integration. If you've read about NBLD, those are very commonly identified. Math, reading, and the ability to, to get a lot of information and understand how it all fits together. So, these kids are often wanting friends. The hardest thing for me was to hear kids tell me I've never been to a birthday party and they're like 9 or 10. I don't have a friend. Nobody likes me. 
Um, we used to have a program at the University of Texas where we actually had kids come in twice a week. And we did actually work on creative drama and helping them understand their feelings and their bodies and everything else. And these were kids with nonverbal learning disabilities and kids with um, Asperger's. And I will never forget, Joey comes, and the, the, the meetings are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, It's called the UT Club. They were thinking they were going to college, which is cool, I guess. And um, he comes in, and it's Wednesday. He said, Miss Peg, I'm here for the UT Club. And I said, uh, it's Wednesday. That's on Tuesday. He said, uh-uh, it is Tuesday, and I'm here for club. No, I think it's Wednesday. No, it's Tuesday. So I like, a, you know, the kind of the foggy professor. I go to the secretary and I say, what day is it, Sylvia? She says, it's Wednesday. <laughs> I was like, thank God. <laughs> so I called his mom and I said, you have to come get him because it's not Tuesday. She said, I thought it was Wednesday, but he, he was so adamant I, I brought him. <laughs> but this is the only time that he really had a friendship group that he had other people because across Austin, maybe in, in the school you have one or two, but across Austin we had like 15 to 20. And so he had connections. So he looked forward to that because that's the connection he had. And one of the things with research that's always interesting, those of you who are doctoral students or professors or, or medical people, you very often find there's unintended consequences. And so an unintended consequence of our research were two. One, these kids actually formed bonds and actually kept in touch. I've been gone from UT for 10 years. And I still hear from the parents. And I still hear that, yes, they're still friends. But the parents, there's not much out there for parents of children with nonverbal learning disabilities. And the parents bonded because they had to wait. It didn't make sense to go and drop the kid off and then come back. They waited. And so they sat in the outer office of our, our suite. And they actually sat and talked and got to know each other, had good ideas, shared, thought of other ways to handle things. And it was a great idea. A follow-up research project would have been to actually look at that and, and see what kinds of pro um, progress you could make. Have you ever said, I'm going to eat on the road? You ever think of what that really means? Those are the kinds of things my kids have trouble with, raiding cats and dogs I already told you about. Um, they can be easygoing and oblivious. You know, So these are kids that don't stand out like kids with autism or with Asperger's, but they just are suffering and having as much of a struggle as the children with Asperger's, but they're unidentified very frequently. And I don't know in Canada, but in the U.S., we really don't have a category that they can get special help from. So one of the ways that we try to make that happen is if they have a math problem or they have ADHD. Then we can get them a 504, or I'm not sure what you call it here. It's um, Americans with Disabilities Act in the U.S. Or sometimes we can get them an IEP, but not all the time. So what are kinds of kids that have NVLD? Children that have hydrocephalus. Now, most hydrocephalus is caught at birth now, which is really cool. But this is an MRI of a child that I saw who was eight, who had, who had hydrocephalus that was un, not identified. He didn't really have symptoms that you would think from a medical point of view, but he had symptoms of problems with understanding others, problems relating, problems with reasoning. And so just, I can't think of the right word, by accident, we said it might be good to get an MRI. And this is what came out. Veliocardiofacial syndrome is another one. It's characterized by cleft palate, heart abnormalities, learning disabilities, and other disorders. Very often, you find nonverbal learning disabilities also coexisting. So now I want to switch to autism. Okay, and again, keep in mind that I'm going to talk a little bit about DSM-4 because that's just, that's what was in place. But these are people that generally have intense circumscribed interests and behaviors. They have some compulsions and rituals. It's not OCD, but they like things in a certain way. A lot of kids, how many of you have seen a child at three or four that lines things up? Does that make them autistic? But what happens when I'm training, someone will say, well, the parent will just innocently say, well, he's lining stuff in. And my, excuse me, my trainee all of a sudden will go down the autism path. And I'm like, whoa. Okay, again, that's what I'm talking about as far as being a little bit careful. 
um, they have an interest or an inattention to. I think it's really important to think about this both ways. It's not that they're just disinterested. That's what we used to think of with autism. But they don't pay attention to the social interaction. So they don't have the joint attention that you see where mom says, look at that. Or they have shared enjoyment. Or they are able to really understand how someone el where someone else is coming from. So this is really a problem. And, and some of the recent research out of Harvard with Jer uh, Jerome Kagan has found that you can identify these kids at a very young age. Right now at the U of M, which is Minnesota, not Michigan, just to be really clear, um, we have established an uh, infant and a toddler uh, clinic. And what we're doing is we're having actually the siblings of kids that are already identified as aut with autism, having them come in so that, because we know that if we identify these kids at a really, really young age, we have a lot more progress. We still don't have good markers as to what it is in an early age. Two things that come out are joint attention being a problem and shared enjoyment. So what we're doing is we're running a fairly large study to see what kinds of things. So we're videotaping, we're observing, we're trying to see, okay, how do these kids, not every sibling of a child with autism has autism, but they're at much higher risk. Does that make sense? Okay, so you already know all of these things, but I just thought it'd be good if I put them up. This is really interesting because this is one, the one that everyone thinks is really, really true. And now with Jerome Kagan's work and some of the other things, we're, we're actually seeing that there are very, very early signs. So the signs are there before age three. And again, the research shows that ABA for younger kids really, really works well. All right, boys are more affected. I'm sorry, men. You were just more vulnerable, period. You often show tactile defensiveness. One of the things that I listen to when I do a parent interview is when they say, when he was really, really little, I'd pick him up and he would tighten. Think about what it's like. You know that Gerber baby, the one that sucks you in? Babies are exhausting. Babies are frustrating. The only reason we don't not have babies is because they pull us in. What if you had a baby that didn't show shared enjoyment? What if you had a baby that didn't give you eye contact? What if you had a baby that every time you picked it up, tightened up and didn't want anything to do with you? How would you react? It's really a, a transactional thing that goes on. And what we know is that that's very different for these kids, even from the get-go. So when you talk to the parents, they'll often say, tightened up. They'll also often say, he wouldn't sleep. How is it when you're really tired and the baby is crying every couple hours and you can't soothe them? You know, to be a mom and a dad, you really have to buy into it. And when a child is really not giving it back to you, it's really, really hard. So there's just some beginning studies about abuse with these kids because they don't give back. Eye contact is generally poor. They may be frequently retarded, but I've worked with a lot of kids that are average to gifted. Okay? They often repeat what you say, and they may show stereotype movements. Now, none of these is absolutely diagnostic of autism, and you don't always have to have all of them. But there's a different flavor to working with it. And the only way that you can really be really good about this is if you work with a couple, some kids with autism so you get a feel. I think you have to know what it feels like to be in the same room. Some of them can be very charming and do everything you ask, and others are just really, you're taping me, I can't say it. Um, they're really, really difficult. <laughs> okay? So most people believe these are biological in nature. We know that 20 to 30% of siblings of autistic individuals are also autistic. So that's one of the reasons we've established this new clinic. Twin studies show a concordance rate for identical twins of 96%. That's really, really high. Okay? Of the other 4%, what is true is that it's usually birth complications for the other twin. For dizygotic twins, which are fraternal twins, there's no such good rate. So I gave you the introduction. Now I think the, the sexy stuff is the brain activation differences, okay? There are many different places in the brain that we found already for children with autism that have different patterns of activation. And they're particularly in Broca's area, which is right here, which is that area that is conversation. They're typically, typically in this area, which encompasses social understanding, language, 
But also there's a really cool part right here that actually is specialized in your brain to identify faces. The fusiform face gyrus, which is really cool, isn't it? That we, why would we have such an important part of our brain specialized for that? That's just food for thought. I think it's cool. And then the sensory motor areas for the tactile defensiveness, the difficulties with um, sensory um, sounds, uh, hear, uh, sight, touch, all of them very sensitive. I think if you have never seen the show um, about Temple Graydon, Brandon, it's a really good one to see because what she does is she describes these sensory impact as painful. It's almost like she doesn't have a filter, so she can't say, that's not important, I don't need to listen to that noise out there. It actually is painful. And I think that's really important. So we have kids that come in that cannot tolerate loud noises, can't tolerate. If we had these lights on, I had one kid I'd turn off the over lights. I don't know if you and I did that one, Rachel, or not. But we had to turn that off because there's a buzzing. You can, I can barely hear it. But it was so obnoxious to him, he couldn't concentrate. And he said, please turn off those lights. What do we know? We know that electrophysiological studies, those studies of the brain electrical activity, found that children with autism have a dominant right hemisphere response to linguistic information. Now, why would that be problematic? Most of us have a left hemisphere preference for language. Why would a right hemisphere, which is actually more important for the prosody or the intonation or how well you know how well you say if like if I say I'm going to the store tonight versus I'm going to the store tonight two different emotions right where the ability to detect novel stimuli is studied with children with autism is found that they respond much later okay so if something is new and different most of us process it very quickly but if I have autism I process it a little bit more slowly and so I don't react the same way. And so I'm trying to use parts of my brain that are not really developed to understand the, what's coming in. And then I'm taking a lot longer because those pathways take longer to come over to the right side, meaning the left side. So children with autism re react to novel sti stimuli or unexpected stimuli as overstimulating. Okay? So it becomes painful. It becomes something that I can't tolerate. That'd be like if you were in a flashing strobe light disco for a very long time. It becomes that much uh, difficulty. We also know from some of the re research now that these kids are chronically over aroused. And this is going to be important in a minute because I'm going to explain why that's so important. We know that kids with the lowest ability seem to have the highest level of over arousal. So it's almost like if I took my fingernails on an old blackboard and move them down and you know that was happening a lot so how am I going to learn how am I going to pay attention to socially how am I going to monitor my emotions how am I going to control how I feel does that make sense so this just over arousal already sets you up for having some difficulty in processing what's going on and if I'm over aroused I process it later think of the last time you were highly anxious Maybe you never have been. But the last time I really totally remember was when I took the licensing exam. Scared to death, right? I only, it was $250 when I did it. I was a poor student. That was a lot of money. And I knew if I failed, first of all, I'd, I'd feel terrible about myself, but I also would have to pay another $250 and study some more. Anxiety levels or overstimulation make it to the point where you can't think. And this is where these kids are almost all the time. This arousal, like I just said, is related to poor information processing. If I'm over aroused, it's hard for me to understand what's going on. And particularly in social processing, which is often novel. How many of you have done social skills training with kids with autism or kids with some of these difficulties? I have. How has it worked? Works in the time in my lab doesn't work so well to generalize. Okay, so those of you in my class have already seen this, okay? So I had a kid, worked really, really well, knew how to greet me. Hi, my name is Peg. Hi, I'm Pam. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So he had the script down, he just didn't know how, where to go from there. I mean, what do I do that? I got your name. 
I would generally ask you, well, how are you or what do you do? But he hadn't made it to the next step, okay? So these findings have led to the hypothesis that autism in involves dysfunction of the cortical limbic reticular system, very fancy way of saying these structures here, which are the limbic system, are really closely related to the frontal lobe and to the reticular activating system, which is your awareness system. Okay, These structures are going to be very important, the amygdala particularly in a minute. We're going to talk about hippocampus is lays down new memories. Amygdala is important for fight or flight, for high anxiety. The frontal lobe is very important for monitoring your behavior and changing it. And as my class knows, this is one of my favorite structures, the interior cingulate, which is involved in error checking and monitoring. Am I doing this right? Do I need to change? Maybe she's, maybe she's upset because she's had a bad day. That's what most of us would think. A child with autism or nonverbal learning disability would think what? I'm having a good day, so you must be, right? So here's this cool, cool structure. The fusiform face gyrus right here in your, in your temporal lobe. People with autism are thought to see faces differently. And we did a test of this, so I'm going to show you some of that data in a minute. So my question to you to think about, is there a reciprocal relationship between social interaction and wiring of these synapses? If I don't have experiences, what happens here? If I shut myself off, what is the translation into real life, into the environment? So many of us are saying this, this whole thing is important because there's a biological reason, structures and connections are different, and it force shadows the child from acting a different way. And they don't get the same practice or the same experiences in the environment that you would expect. So these things don't get wired as well. There's a big saying in neuropsychology, neurons that wire together fire together. Okay? If it's not working, I'm not going to fire, and I'm not going to make those connections. And those connections are heavily wired during the first three years of life. And how did we just talk about that as being a crucial point? Does that make sense? So I think that, you know, in the old days, and I'm that old, moms used to be blamed for autism, right? We now know that that's not accurate, thank you, thankfully. Dads aren't blamed either, by the way. Um, but we know that it's a transaction between biology and the environment. So we think it's probably a part of a larger neurological problem. When you are growing from ages zero to three, your brain has many more connections that it needs and it prunes them back. So with, we know that with kids with autism, they have increased brain volume, particularly in the white matter, meaning that the brain hasn't pruned back. They have too many connections. Too many connections in your brain is not good because it is inefficient. And it takes a lot longer. We also know from autopsy studies that the cells are smaller and densely packed. So the neurons, the neurons can't talk to each other as well. Okay? We know that the differences are in the frontal lobe, the corpus callosum, which is that structure that connects the two hemispheres, the amygdala, one of our great structures, the cerebellum and other brain structures. So we know there are differences in particular areas. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So what can neuroimaging tell us? There has been no studies in NVLD and neuroimaging, none. There's been some in high-functioning autism and some in Asperger's, but very often these two are clumped together, if you read the literature. And so, I don't know, are these two the same? Generally what has been different has been these repetitive behaviors, but now DSM-5 has put it all together. And high-functioning autism do have a language delay, but now in DSM-5 they don't need to anymore. Okay, so there's been a shift, right? But everything that is there that goes together is they all seem to have social competence problems. So what did we do? Well, we wanted to target some areas. We wanted to say, okay, let's not just put the whole brain in the magnet. Well, we have the whole brain in the magnet, but let's not analyze the whole brain. That's 120 comparisons. Those of you who are statistics, what would I have to do to correct that P so that if I found a significance, I would know I was finding a significance? 
it'd be like many zeros. So what we thought was, let's look at some particular structures. One of the, one of the big candidates was the amygdala. Again, I kind of explained that. And also the hippocampus, because that's what lays down our new memories. These areas are involved in emotional reaction, and there's a lot of connections to the frontal lobe. Okay? So we also wanted to look at the temporal lobe. Why? Because you've got that fusiform face gyrus here, right? And we wanted to also see if language word meaning and language nonverbal meaning, if there was a difference. Could they pick up on, on context and gestures and facial expressions as well as the language? What do you think kids with autism generally key in on? Is it the language or is it, is, is it the intonation behind it? It's mostly the language. So I can say the same sentence in two different ways and it has a different meaning. But if I'm literal, it means the same no matter what. That's why sarcasm doesn't work with these kids. And I actually don't think you should use sarcasm with many kids. But So we also wanted to look at the fusiform gyrus. Okay? It's really interesting that this area is really close to the temporal lobe, which is language, and really close to the occipital lobe, which is vision. Right? Whoever did this was really smart. So we wanted to look at neuroimaging. We were going to look at functional MRI. This is a picture of one of our kids viewing something. Um, colors that are orange and red and yellow mean a lot of activation. Colors that are blue mean not so much. This is the back part of the brain. This is the front part of the brain. Okay, so what do you see here? You know that there's visual. They're looking, which is really good because we want them to watch our movies. And they're processing it with the language both verbally and non-verbally because this is around in the temporal lobe of the insular region. Does that make sense? We also wanted to look at anatomical image, neuroimaging. So we wanted to do structural. We also did DTI, which is diffusion tensor in, um, imaging, but we have, I don't have those results quite yet. We're working on it. These things are incredibly time intensive. How many of you do MRI analysis? Okay, so each one of our brains takes us 12 hours to process. So it's a lot of time. Okay? And this is the DTI. Isn't this cool? It shows you the connections, right, from right to left and front to back. In our study, which, I, again, we're just analyzing, we're, we're thinking that the front to back ones are the more important ones that are not being connected up. We'll see. Maybe next time I come, if you invite me back, I can share that with you. All right, what do we know right now before we even did our study? We know that kids with ASD have larger brains. We know they have more white matter. So more white matter means more myelin, more axons, more connections, but again, not efficient. We know in some of the studies there's been a larger amygdala and hippocampus, at least through adolescence. And there is some suggestion the anterior cingulate might be questionable. So we decided to look at all those things. It's important because when you think of white matter, why would white matter be so important for this? Well, the connectivity of the systems in the brain are thought to be important for social competence. That ability for the brain to talk. You know, a lot of the literature talks about right brain, left brain training. Guess what? There's no such thing. You have three connections in your brain. There's no way I can just train my left and not work my right. Okay, so what I'm thinking is that it's not just right and left, but it's front and back. My visual system, my fusiform gyrus is talking to my frontal lobe through my anterior cingulate. I'm thinking about what's going on, and then I give, I give more information back. So there's a feedback loop that's going on. Okay, recent work indicates that the white matter develops slowly over time from birth to the mid-20s. Those of you who are young here, you're still developing. Your brain is still going. It's so much better news for those of us who are much older. Because it used to be thought that you were done with your brain by the time you were three. And now we know that if with the right connections, with the right stimulation, your brain is developing all your life. With neurons, it's use it or lose it. So crossword puzzles, no, I'm kidding. Okay. So here's what the brain looked. So what did we do? Well, this took us seven years, by the way. These are not easy studies because we were trying to find kids that didn't have a lot of other problems. Plus, they had to lay still in the magnet. How many of you had had an MRI? Uh-huh. What's it like? What's it like? 
Didn't bother you at all, huh? It's claustrophobic. It's a long donut that the table moves in. Now think about this. You're eight years old and you have autism. You're already scared. I'm sitting there going, please don't move. Please don't move. This is costing me $1,000. And you move. I had one kid come screaming out of the magnet. So, so it, took us, it took us seven years to get this many kids. Most neuroimaging studies are between seven and ten kids. So we did really well. But we threw out at least half as many in each group except the controls. Okay? These kids could have no history of neurological disorders, no head injuries, no seizures, no significant psychopathology. I wanted as clean a sample. And one of the reviewers that reviewed our paper said, you have super kids with autism. And I was like, well, fine, I do. Okay? But we found a high level of ADHD in both groups. We couldn't screen that out or we'd have nobody. So we just decided that was one of our limitations. When you write papers, this is what happens. You know, you do your best, but you can't control everything. So based on that previous research I talked about, these are what we hypothesized. We thought, you know, big, more white matter, more amygdala. We didn't know what the anterior cingulate would look like because there's been nothing published. And we thought the caudate would differ because some of the work I've done with ADHD found that the caudates were smaller. So since there was such a high incidence of ADHD, we thought that would be there. So, so what did we find? Well, guess what? We did find the hippocampi and amygdala for the Asperger group only, which is high-functioning autism now, were bigger. The nonverbal learning disabilities and the controls were were the same. They were not significantly different. For the Asperger's and the nonverbal learning disability group, that anterior cingulate was smaller. And significantly so. So why would that be important? Why, is it, why, why would that be important if I don't have as many connections in my anterior cingulate? What does that mean? Right. My emotional regulation is not going to be as good. I'm not going to be able to detect errors. I'm not going to be able to do that. In order to do that, I, then I have to change my behavior. Okay? Thank you. The caudate was significantly smaller for the NVLD group because they had more kids with ADHD. And when we took the kids out of the NVLD group, it was 75% that had ADHD. The, the, the difference became even more pronounced. So, next study would be to try to get these groups without ADHD. But I'll be retired by the time I could get that many kids. So here's what here's it here's it graphically. I'm very visual, so this helps me a lot. But you can see in both cases that this is the control group, the bigger ones. But you can see in both cases, both clinical groups are smaller. So are they the same? Is Asperger's and NVLD? Because they don't differ from each other. This doesn't answer that question, does it? But still interesting. And then this is the caudate. And the difference really was in the NVLD, particularly in the uh, right caudate. But both clinical groups had smaller anterior cingulates. Okay? So structurally, I didn't really find a difference. This is the it, between the two clinical groups. This is just to give you an idea of how the anterior cingulate was volumetrically outlined. And then the caudates. Okay, so you have to do it for each side of the brain. It's semi-automated, but you have to go in there and fix it because the computer's stupid. So what did we find neuropsychologically? Okay, so hold that in mind. Not a whole lot different structural, right? Maybe it's behavioral. Maybe we'll find it behaviorally. So what we found was that children with Asperger's showed more problems than kids with nonverbal learning disabilities in verbal fluency, which is that ability to use your language really easily. Name as many words as you can think of that start with F, or as many as you can start with is A, and so on. And sorting. How many of you are familiar with the sorting test for the Dells Kaplan, which is a test of executive functions? Not many. So what you have to do on this is you, you give them six cards, and then you say to them, sort these in different ways. And so they sort them as many ways as they can think of, and they tell you what it is. They didn't have any trouble with that. What they had trouble with is when I sorted the cards, telling me how I sorted so it's more of a perspective kind of thing. Well, how would I, I had one kid, smart kid, kind of a sassy kid, 
typical American, I guess, said to me, how the hell should I know how you sorted it? <laughs> okay, okay. All right. We also used a test. This is kind of a neat test actually out of Alberta, Canada. It's called the Child and Adolescent Social Perception Test. It's all of $50. It is a videotape, and they watch these kids doing things together. And the words are masked. So you hear things like, <laughs> and you have to infer thinking, and you have to infer tone, and you have to infer what emotion's going on. And what we found that was interesting is that these kids have been drilled so much in what emotion is this that actually the kids with Asperger's did significantly differ from the controls, but the NVLDs did not. But when it came to what, what told you how this person was feeling, like the context or what was going on, both of the clinical groups significantly differed from the controls. So they... They could identify basic emotions because they've been worked on so much, but they couldn't tell why. If, they, if you put the context in, and it's much harder to do it that way, they couldn't say, well, he's feeling that way because that, you, know, you took his sweater away. Right? Which I think is an interesting finding because if you're looking at intervention, you want to think about how do I help them key in on some of those key words. Here's the other thing that we found, and this hasn't been published in too many other articles. This is the BASC. If you know the BASC, you know that high scores are not good, okay? So what we found was for both clinical groups, they had much more difficulty with anxiety, depression, withdrawal, attention, and social difficulties. This is a conglomerate of the parent and teacher forms. So if I'm older, it, most of these kids were like the average age was around 12 to 13. If I'm older and I've had a lot of peer rejection, some of the things that need to be paid attention to are these areas and the withdrawn. And we sometimes don't think about it. We sometimes don't think about the long-term toll this is. I can remember um, in my postdoc, how many of you had to do a postdoc or will have to do a postdoc? Some of you I know will have to do a postdoc to get licensed. So in my postdoc, I was approached and they said, I have a really interesting case for you. What do you think that means? If I say I have a really interesting case, that means run. No, yeah, run. nobody else wants it, you're the postdoc, you get it, right? So they came and I met with this guy and he was very okay, but he was very unusual, different greeted me very strangely like I just greeted you. Um, he had nonverbal learning disabilities, had been diagnosed um, from somewhere else. And he said, I will give you a million dollars. Obviously, he had a lot of money. I will give you a million dollars if you can find me a wife. And I said, well, why can't you find a wife? Well, they don't like me. Women don't like me. I don't know why, they just don't like me. And I thought, I know why. <laughs> I went home and I said to my husband, we're getting a divorce. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Um, but, you know, he had no clue that this was really inappropriate, right? He didn't tell the intake worker that he was coming to see me to get a wife. Um, but he didn't understand why he couldn't connect. He tried um, Match.com. He tried all those ones. I don't know them. But he tried all of those, and it didn't work. One date, and that was it. And so he couldn't quite connect to all of it. And it was a really sad thing because he didn't have friends. He had money. He had lots and lots and lots of money. And so he thought, well, I can buy everything else. Let me buy a companion. I saw him for two and a half years throughout my three year span. And no, I didn't find him a wife. But the whole point of it was to try to help him understand what was going on. And it was really painstaking because by that point the brain was pretty well formed. And that's what's sad. And what I actually uncovered with this, this person was high levels of depression. All right, so we found some differences with structural. We didn't find any difference with structure. We found some neuropsych differences. What about functional? Is the brain, does the brain react the same way with kids with Asperger's versus kids that have nonverbal learning disabilities? So we use functional magnetic resonance imaging. Has anyone done any studies using this? 
this is painful because you have to find the right stimuli. You have to have, a, I am not a script writer, but I had to learn how to write a script that was 17 seconds long that had a beginning, middle, and an end and a punch and that a kid would sit through, right? That also measured what I was interested in. So we had to do a lot of piloting. What we did was we developed a video of other kids interacting Okay, so sometimes they were playing with other kids and it was all good. Sometimes they were, uh, were pushed out of the program. Sometimes it was just a neutral kind of thing. We, ha we thought we were going to look at angry or sad, happy, and neutral. What do you think happened to our neutral condition? How do the kids interpret the neuro not control, not the neurotypical, but the other kids? Neutral interactions were seen as angry or sad. We had to throw them out. Okay? So when, when it's ambiguous, they're going to interpret it a different way. And I think that's really important because most of us don't sit there with a big smile on our face or gritting our teeth. I think it's really important to understand how these kids are seeing the world. That it is possibly not the most friendly place. Okay? So we threw all those out and we just used the two ends. All right. We wanted to know, would their brains react the same way to social dynamic stimuli? We'd already done an earlier study where we had them look at faces with just you know, plain emotions. No difference there. But what happens if it's dynamic? What do these kids have trouble with? It's not just looking at a face and saying, that's happy. It's understanding the situation. So because this was so much more difficult for them to sit still, we lost a lot of our participants. So it went down to 12 in each group. See how I'm just kind of losing people. All right, we had nine males and three females. 34 were European American, one African American, and one Native American. Okay, so I can't talk about ethnicity here and the effect. And it was part of this neuropsych study. Here's what we found, which I think is, well, I think is cool, right? So here is the control. And they're watching positive, what you do is you average over time and then you subtract. So this is the positive versus the negative. So when they were seeing happy versus angry and sad. And the yellow and orange mean that there was more activation for the happy than the sad. For the controls. And look at, look at how much. So when we're watching a video of children interacting, controls significantly showed more activation to both positive and negative. Kids with Asperger's found had more interaction to the negative, but still not what we not what we would expect. And kids with nonverbal learning disabilities were really not act, interact were not activating very much. So we went to the next step. What about that temporal middle gyrus, that part in the temporal lobe where the language is? What is the difference? What we found is that control showed more response to the valence change. In other words, they paid attention. Was it positive or negative, right? Then either of the control, either of the clinical groups. Kids with NVLD responded more to positive than to negative. Okay, so they paid attention to the negative more, and those parts of their brain lit up. But children with Asperger's were least sensitive to either one. They didn't react the same way. Their brain didn't. Okay, so they're not processing these kinds of things in the same way that you'd expect. Any questions on that so far? Because that's kind of an important finding, that there is a functional difference. It's, it's in more in the matter of degree. And so we just, one of the things that outgrew from this study was we wrote a, a long article about, is there really a difference between nonverbal learning disabilities and Asperger's autism? And we, based on all the evidence that we could find, we basically said, yes, there is. But the question is, well, can't do it. The question is, is it on a continuum? So is NVLD at the, at the mild end, or is it just totally different? And, and that question I can't answer. We don't know yet. We're still studying it. The other thing we found, and my class already saw this, was in the NVLD group, we found a higher number than expected of children with benign cysts or lesions. And they're pretty pronounced. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. 25% of the kids with nonverbal learning disabilities were found to show those anomalies compared to 4% of children in the Asperger or control groups. Cysts are not that uncommon, but this rate was much higher than you'd expect. Okay. 
here's one of the little girls that we did. This is her frontal lobe. This black space is the cyst. Okay, and this was a by chance finding. She'd not seen a neurologist. She'd not seen anything. I had. I actually had. Her, I was so horrified. The parent is sitting there, so they saw this scan, and I'm like, oh boy. Um, here comes the IRB. So I, I called the radiologist and I said, could you please come down here, stat, because I need you to look at this and see if there's something wrong. He comes down and he looks at it and he says, yeah, so? I said, but look, look at this, look at this. That brain is all gone. He said, well, can she walk? Yeah. Can she talk? Yeah. Can she eat? Yeah. No problem. But I said, she has severe executive function deficits. She has real problems in, in her learning. She has real problems in doing things. I, I, I think this is something that's important. And he said, well, you know, we don't really pay attention to those things. So she went home, because we had a grant and we were bringing in people. We actually had a lot of people from Canada and from the US um, into Michigan. And I, I said to the mom, if it was me, I would go to a neurologist and I would ask another question. I wouldn't just say, well, she's fine, because she's not fine. So they did go to another neurologist in New York City, and he said, well, you know, I don't know that it'll matter if I drain this or not, but he said, let's watch it for a while. And it did get bigger, and so he said, we have to drain it. So I don't know how big it was in the initial part. This, by the time she did this, she was 12. He did drain it, and she did get better but not fully. But this was just a happenstance uh, finding. Now, does that mean we should scan every child? No, this is very expensive, but I think when a child is showing really severe kinds of things and is not responding to, to remediation, that's certainly a question to ask. But I learned, my, I learned a good lesson there, and I think Rachel and I have seen this before, that if, if most of the bodily functions are working fine, they don't necessarily worry about the higher level functions unless you start really questioning. And here's a different one. This is the cerebellum. This is what, the one that most of the kids were like. Okay, And you can see this big black space here, which is a cyst. And again... What do you think the radiologist said to me when I'm calling him down again? Peg, how many more of these are we going to find? So, so the cysts were mostly in the occipital lobe. That's the area of visual spatial reasoning. That's very affected in nonverbal learning disabilities. And that's what's compromised in nonverbal learning disabilities and not Asperger's. So what do we want to do? Where do we want to go from here? I want to continue to look at the neurocognitivity of these kids, and so we're going to do the DTI. And actually, I have a couple people in, in Minnesota now that are really interested in doing this, and hopefully we'll get some funding. We want to see how, they, how do kids with ASD interpret the world? What's it like to be in them? And I, I don't have time today, but we actually developed an intervention program that has been pretty successful. I can give you references if you're interested. And I want to know about that executive functioning, because I think that's a survival skill for real life. You know, we key in on social skills, which is really important, and we key in on visual spatial, and we key in on math. But if you can't change your behavior, if you can't have ideas of why your behavior is not working, if you can't think about how do I make this better, it's really hard for an intervention to take hold. And I think there needs to be a lot more training of our mental health professionals in how to work with these kids because there's more of them than we think. Mm -hmm.